All right, so we'll get started now. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Secure Technology Alliance webinar, Contactless Payments, Issuer Benefits, and Implementation Considerations. My name is Kathy Medich, and I'm Director of Strategic Programs with the Secure Technology Alliance. I want to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available with the presentation deck after the webinar has concluded. We'll also be asking a few polling questions during the webinar, and we hope that you'll answer the polls to provide some direct feedback to our presenters during the event. We have a great set of speakers and topics for today's webinar. I'll lead off and give you a brief overview of the Alliance and our Payments Council, who is hosting the event. Next, Oliver Manahan from Infineon will give you a market update on why contactless is especially relevant now. Oliver is both the chair of our Payments Council as well as the Alliance board chair. Then Jose Correa from NXP Semiconductors will share what's happening with contactless implementations outside of the U.S. and also show some of the key metrics in those markets. TJ Considine from Visa will review contactless payment benefits for issuers. And then Jamie Topolsky from Fiserv will dive into detailed considerations for issuers who are implementing contactless payments. Next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with the Secure Technology Alliance, here's a brief overview. We're a not-for-profit multi-industry association working to stimulate the understanding, adoption, and widespread application of secure solutions. We provide, in a collaborative, member-driven environment, education and information on how smart cards, embedded chip technology, and related hardware and software can be adopted across all markets in the U.S. That's a pretty broad mission. On the right side of the screen, you can see our principal markets, access control, authentication, healthcare, identity management, IoT, mobile, payments, and transportation. As a cross-industry member organization, we have a number of initiatives to stimulate and educate the market. We bring stakeholders together to promote secure solutions technology and address industry challenges. We publish white papers, webinars like these, and workshops and other content as educational resources. We create contents and events that focus on specific markets and technology. We have educational programs, training, and industry certifications to promote experts in our field. We provide networking opportunities for professionals to share their ideas and knowledge. And we have strong industry communications through our PR, web, and social media programs. Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight our Payments Council, which is hosting today's webinar. The Payments Council serves as a focal point for the Alliance payments-related efforts. The Council work focuses on securing payments and payment applications in the U.S. through industry dialogue, technical guidance, and educational programs. The Council has a broad charter. On the right side, you'll see some of the resources that we've published through our Council, which include white papers, infographics, facts on contactless payments, education on tokenization, IoT payments, and blockchain, and implementation considerations for wearables. These are just some of the resources that we are available on our website, and we encourage you to visit securetechnologyalliance.org to see all the resources that are available. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Oliver. Thanks, Kathy. So I'll be handling the first section, why contactless and why now, although I believe first we have our first uh, polling question. Uh, if you wouldn't mind skipping to the next slide. And as they say in uh, polling questions, this is for statistical purposes only. So if you can please select which category best suits uh, the organization you come from, click on, and I think we'll have this up for 10, 15 seconds, give or take. Great, so lots of issuers, but uh, the rest of the um, community is, is fairly well represented too. Um, you know, merchants were doing a specific uh, webinar for them in about a month's time, so um, I'm sure those numbers, so the first two will be reversed at that point, but uh, great representation. If we could move to the first slide then. Great, thanks. So, the first question we often get asked when we start talking about contactless, particularly in the U.S. market, is um, 
we've done this already. So we really wanted to, you know, quickly go over what's changed since the mid 2000s. So there were, in fact, a few trials, some big issuers, uh, some merchants, but there really wasn't enough ubiquity to drive or or uh, change uh, behavior for consumers, etc. And I think there's a few reasons for this. One, I mean, that was back in the era of magnetic stripe swipe. So whether you swiped a card or tapped a card, there was not a really a, a discernible time difference in the transaction. And then around that same time, brand rules um, were not requiring uh, cardholder verification, whether signature or PIN for transactions under a certain dollar amount, um, $25 or $50. So when you added those two together, the, the transaction time was really no different between the two. Um, from a merchant perspective, the point of sale readers uh, had to be added on for contactless. So not only did you have the traditional point of sale where you'd swipe your card, but then there had to be a separate unit. There had to be integration. Um, and in some instances, additional counter space was taken. And the contactless back in the mid 2000s was based on magnetic stripe data. So while it did have um, a small piece of dynamic data, it wasn't as secure as um, the cryptography that we're now all enjoying uh, with the EMV migration that has recently taken place. So next slide, please. So fast forward to 2018 and um, contactless is now based on the EMV standards and is being implemented consistently across the globe. So you know, if a card travels from the US to Europe or from Asia to the US, uh, we can expect the same level of interoperability that we have with you know, previously magnetic stripe cards and now with EMV contact chip cards. And it is the high standard of security that you still get um, with a contact based chip, you get that same cryptography level with a contactless transaction now as well. If you talk to any of the big um, point of sale manufacturers, they will all tell you that they're now integrating the uh, contactless readers right into their standard point of sale. So there's no additional um, integration from a hardware perspective for the merchant to do. It's not taking additional counter space, et cetera. And uh, what's quite different in the US market, and got a little bit more data on this on a subsequent slide, is that merchant enablement is actually leading issuance in this market. So, you know, from, for many markets, the question is always, well, I'll start issuing cards when there's enough merchant adoption. Well, the merchant adoption is actually quite robust already. Um, as noted, there'll be some more data on that in a few slides, but um, the, the numbers bear out now that it's, um, it's actually, a good time to, to look at issuing cards, if not now, um, in the relatively near future. And of course, new form factors such as wearables, mobile devices, et cetera, improve consumer affection around contactless generally. And in many other markets, brands have been requiring contactless adoption. So um, for those consumers that travel um, outside of the US, they'll be seeing contactless transactions uh, fairly frequently um, come back to the US and, and probably hope and expect that that sort of functionality and technology will take hold um, in this market. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so anytime we talk about a new technology or a new proposition, of, you know, it's always best to think, you know, how does this impact the consumer? Will the consumer like it? And as we've seen in markets um, in other parts of the globe, the consumer definitely prefers um, tapping a card versus inserting a card. It's, it's an easier, more intuitive transaction. It certainly feels faster. Uh, the throughput in the lane is, is quicker than having to insert a card. And there's a certain element of a cool factor as well. I know that I have several dual interface cards being a Canadian, and when I come down and, and tap it at a contactless enabled merchant in the US, the merchant is usually like, oh, that's pretty cool. I've seen a phone being tapped before, haven't seen a card tapped. When's that coming? It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. So um, you, you wouldn't think that quote unquote older technology would still have a cool factor like this, but it certainly seems to be the case. And in other markets, we've seen an increase um, in usage and frequency. So people tend to use contactless cards for more lower value transactions, and it becomes top of wallet because uh, the consumer is using that card more often. 
And certainly I, I can speak from the Canadian perspective again that consumers do start seeking out issuers of dual interface cards. Um, it, once they see other people using them, uh, once they have seen that it's a faster transaction, et cetera, and particularly the early adopters and the tech savvy want the latest and greatest. Um, a few other points. There's still no forgot, or there's no forgotten card. If you're just holding on to your card and tapping it, there's no um, concern of having of having left that card in the EMV reader, or perhaps that annoying beep that you get at the end of the transaction if you have in fact forgotten your card in the reader. It's a consistent experience across all devices. So whether it's a contactless card, uh, a wearable such as a watch, a mobile device, you get that same transaction experience of, of tapping through all of those form factors. It's also a foolproof transaction, three interfaces. So if you know you tap your card and for whatever reason there is an, an issue with the tap, if you're using you know a mobile phone or something like that, you have to go and retrieve a card and use that to pay. If you have a card in your hand already and there's a, a glitch with the tap, you can insert the card. Um, and even if there's a problem in that instance, if for whatever reason all of the chip functionality is not working on that point of sale device, um, you can still swipe that card. So you've got the card in your hand and there's no awkward, okay, now I have to find my card because my tap of another device didn't work. And it also opens up additional use cases and particularly as we've seen in other markets such as Transport for London over in the UK, um, consumers are now more readily using you know, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, so open loop branded payment cards to take um, public transit rides with. So we expect uh, that to happen particularly in the major metropolitan areas in the US such as you know, the, the New York MTA in Washington, WMATA, CTA in Chicago, SEPTA in the Philadelphia area, um, BART uh, in the West Coast, etc. So uh, next slide then please. So for the issuers, um, particularly pertinent to this webinar, uh, EMV clearly improved security, but at the same time there was an increase in transaction time, and in some instances, you know, that transaction time was excruciatingly long. Uh, certainly, the brands have have done some good things to uh, work with uh, acquirers, point of sale vendors, etc., to get those transaction times to a more reasonable level, but it still feels a little bit longer. Now, as I noted earlier, contactless transactions now have the same level of EMV security but contactless is also a decreased track transaction time so typically we say you know it's less than a half a second to complete a contactless transaction so you tap the point of sale beeps and then you go on the authorization still goes on etc but um, in terms of the consumer having to interact with the point of sale it's sub half a second and uh, other markets have shown that consumers use dual interface cards more frequently, particularly for lower value transactions. So there's a tender shift from cash to electronic. And therefore, for all of us that you know partake in uh, processing of electronic transactions, we, we think that's a benefit. Um, certainly, and I'll speak to my home market again now, I will see in coffee shops and places like that where you used to see you know, a $5 or a $10 bill uh, being used to purchase a couple of coffees. It's now either using a mobile app or tapping a card. I rarely see cash in those types of what used to be traditional cash heavy merchant categories. And vast majority of face-to-face -face transactions are still card based. So uh, dual interface cards help shift consumer behavior to tap, thus enabling the shift to mobile. So one of the questions we often get is, you know, why would we do a card that's contactless when, you know, we could do one of the pays, uh, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay, et cetera. And the fact of the matter is, except for those that are near and dear to payments or the tech savvy or early adopters, the vast majority majority of people are still pulling out their cards because it's something that works and behaviorally for the past 40 odd years it's it's the way that they've been used to paying for things at the point of sale. So, oh, next slide please. From a merchant perspective, um, EMV tended to lead to an increase in transaction time. So, you know, the, the quick chip, the, the, the faster chip, 
has helped, but still not as fast as that sub half second transaction um, that contactless gives you. So contactless reduces the transaction time, hence faster throughput. And as I noted earlier, it's still seen as cool um, by early adopters and tech savvy. So, you know, the, the earlier merchants that adopt it are seen as those that are sort of in touch with consumer demands, particularly those that um, uh, fall into those categories of uh, tech savvy early adopter. Um, with EMV migration, most of the new point of sale devices, and as this has happened in the US market over the past three or four years, most of the new point of sale devices have contactless capability already built in. So it's no longer a decision for the merchant to say, hey, I have to buy a separate unit. I have to figure out how to integrate that from a hardware perspective. The question really becomes, do I enable that contactless functionality within the device that I already have? So, you know, not simple, but um, a lot less of a complicated decision as it was, you know, a dozen years ago. And for those merchants that then decide to enable for contactless cards, it's also enabling for any contactless device. So whether that's a card, a mobile phone, a wearable such as watches or even rings, or you know, we've probably all read the, the various form factors that are coming out with contactless built into them. Um, when the merchant enables, they're enabling for all of those um, as they turn it on. Next slide, please. So some statistics. So I, I referenced you know, earlier on that merchants are actually leading the way or acceptance is leading the way over issuance. So 46% uh, of transactions in the U.S. market occur at contactless enabled merchants. Um, and this is, you know, brand specific data from Visa and MasterCards. Very similar. In fact, it's very close. I think down to 50% up from the 46%, which was the, um, the first quarter of 2018 numbers. 70% of merchant locations are capable of contactless transactions. So, you know, it's that question again for them if they want to enable it. And of the new terminals that are shipping um, out to merchants, over 95% of those have the contactless capability. So certainly that the whole acceptance market is either already enabled or quite primed to be enabled, um, you know, if they start seeing issuance of contactless devices uh, becoming more prevalent. And there's a 10% increase in active unique merchants uh, in the U.S. Uh, year over year. So also a pretty good growth curve there. From an issuer perspective, 5% um, of the cards are contactless today, 7% uh, credit, 1% debit. But there is an 80% growth in contactless transactions year over year. So granted from a small base, but um, that, that uh, growth is happening uh, fairly dramatically and what issuers are finding is that without too much marketing or knowledge of where contactless merchants are they are seeing that consumers quite intuitively figure out their card can do contactless and and do the transactions and the transaction growth is occurring um, as they were expecting and the average ticket size for a contactless transaction is you know just below twenty three dollars which speaks to the share shift from cash as well because in um, in typical contact uh, chip or swipe transactions, that number tends to be quite higher, like seventy or eighty dollar range. So you know this this is clearly since it's a twenty two something dollar average, you know many of those transactions quite uh, instinctively will be you know below ten dollars or below fifteen dollars as well. So where people would have pulled out uh, cash or coins before, they're now pulling out cards more frequently. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, now I'm passing it over to Jose Correa. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. So um, I'm going to cover a bit of uh, the status of uh, international implementations on contactless, uh, thanks to uh, both terminals and, and card issuance. Uh, this is a follow up, I guess, uh, for those that that were able to join the, the webinar we had the last year, but uh, you'll see some some references to the numbers that we presented back then and the, the use cases, but uh, it's also a way to show how, how it has uh, grown from, from, from that point in time. So we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, we're going to focus again, I mean, uh, uh, Last year, we looked at the UK, Australia, and Canada as, as, the key, as the three leading markets. We're going to do the same thing again, but showing how it has changed 
uh, from from uh, in, in the past few months and years, and how uh, acceptance is, is is growing all over the place as well, right? So on the issuance side in the UK, we we see a significant jump uh, from from uh, 50 to 65 percent of all cards in the field now uh, being contactless, and and with the majority of the population now electing to actually tap to pay instead of inserting uh, uh, the card or, or swiping. Uh, and we also find new use cases, right? So, so in the UK, transport for London was probably one of the main drivers for, for contactless adoption, but we see that model expanding with contactless donations on the uh, Church of England. And um, there was also a news a couple of days ago that, that uh, street entertainers, uh, buskers, were, were, would take uh, contactless payments as well, uh, contactless uh, donations on the street. So you can see how uh, uh, contactless is pretty much everywhere, and and it's clearly displacing those low value transactions, displacing the cash transactions uh, in the UK. Oh, next slide, please. In Australia, we see a, a similar similar uh, similar effect of contactless implementation. Right. What's interesting in Australia is, is how contactless is not just a, a significant share of, a, or a large share of, of card payments. It's now a significant share of the, the, the major uh, contributor to all, all payments, including cash and traditional cards. So uh, clearly, again, we see cases of cash displacement, but we also see uh, we also see them this method being the preferred method by the consumer, uh, and and it's in, in big thanks for on. On the acceptance levels that that Australia currently has. Um, next slide, please. Finally, in, in Canada, that uh, Oliver covered a, a little bit already, uh, based on his personal experience, uh, we see the same thing, right? So, so the share of transactions is is, is growing, uh, not only as, as a share of, of, of card-based transactions, but as a, as a whole. And then we see uh, additional models that are are Following the example of, of, of Transport for London, where, where you see contactless and open payment usage in, in, in places like Vancouver, Translink. And, and then we also are seeing a, a significant increase of use of all contact, uh, of contactless cards over any other platform, not only card, but also mobile and, and, and cash based. Now, uh, we move to the next slide, please. Now, what's interesting now is that these three markets are in no way alone, right? So we see all all around the world, uh, countries are moving and, and promoting more contactless uh, uh, acceptance and, and issuance. And we see significant results of, of efforts done in different regions. So in, in some cases like Singapore, where we where it's a countrywide effort, right? That, that uh, as, as part of a smart country initiative, uh, they are they are looking to display uh, display uh, cash with contactless uh, payment, and they've been quite successful at it with acceptance being extremely high. In Europe, we have cases like the Czech Republic and Poland, where where acceptance is now a given. And and again, following the same example and and targeting that cash displacement on on public transportation, we see uh, increased usage on 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 regional and and city uh, public transportation systems. We also have cases like Spain, where it's not only an increased uh, usage of contactless cards, but also increased usage in cards in general that ha that is dri uh, that is driving this uh, this increased volumes on contactless transactions. And 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 finally, in Latin America, uh, we also have uh, several countries. Uh, Brazil is an example, but Chile, I think, is probably leading on on the acceptance uh, acceptance piece. And, and also implementing a program where public transportation uh, now now will accept uh, contactless payments. Uh, again, changing a market dynamic that, that was uh, quite firm, firmly established in Latin America in the past. Now, uh, next slide, please. As to why this is happening, I mean, it's it's no secret. The the payment networks, uh, it, obviously, that the we we know that that. Provides a better experience for the consumer, but it's also uh, because of the, the consistent efforts for the different payment networks, right? And and that is reflected on on the recommendations, mandates, and policies that the payment networks have have uh, uh, promoted and are promoting in the next few years. 
uh, with card issuance in most of the world uh, being pretty much a, a mandated, uh, contactless as well as these card issuance being mandated uh, in some markets as early as 2019. And then on the acceptance front, uh, pretty much all new terminals being now um, contactless enabled uh, and uh, in, in the near future, even replacing those uh, terminals that are, that are not contactless enabled yet. So with that, we close the section so we can move to the next slide for another question for the audience. And here's, we'd like to, I think the, the strong presence of issuers will, will help provide really valuable information on this one. I'll give a few seconds for the next Okay, that's quite interesting. Uh, numbers, yes, uh, even even split in couple options there, uh, and it's it would be interesting to see how how I think if we can track this this answers for for future events and future webinars how how uh, plans are changing for for different issuers. Uh, so with, with that, I I think thanks thanks for your time and. Uh, Hand it over to TJ. Thank you, Jose. Uh, folks, my name is TJ Considine, and I'll be talking through what we view as the issuer benefits of contactless. Next slide, please. So there are kind of two classes of benefits for contactless. There are the strategic and qualitative benefits uh, that fall under essentially competitive differentiation. Then there's the quantitative business, quantitative business case that we've alluded to based on cash displacement. So under competitive differentiation, um, contactless transactions are faster than EMV. And we have research that suggests that consumers prefer contactless to EMV, to MagStripe, and to mobile wallets, which we'll show in the next slide. Um, so consumers prefer contactless, and by issuing contactless, especially by leaving the markets, issuers can appear innovative. Uh, they can appear like they're leaving the market, like they're doing um, things to move uh, contactless or the, the payments industry forward. Um, additionally, as Jose alluded to, contactless is pretty mature globally. Within the U.S., we're definitely trailing here. I mean. Um, some stats that I know are that in Europe, uh, about 50% of transactions, face-to-face of -face transactions are contactless, and then there are certain places where it's much higher than that. Um, what that means for the U.S. is that consumers that are traveling abroad have a suboptimal experience compared with everyone else, uh, say, in the line in the coffee shop in London or something like that. So for issuers that are actually issuing contactless here, they're providing a globally inter interoperable and consistent experience. When you combine both of those things together, um, consumers prefer contactless, they're globally interoperable, and it's a better POS experience, uh, contactless cards can help issuers achieve top of wallet status. On the flip side, there's a strong quantitative business case to be built around contactless. Uh, cash is still a massive opportunity in the US. It's, about $2 trillion in annual PV, or roughly 20% of purchase PCE. And because cash is typically used in these high transaction throughput, but low average ticket environments, places like fast food, like food and grocery, like pharmacy, um, cash actually represents an even higher share of transactions at about 33%. Uh, primarily, this is due to consumer habituation and the perception of ease. Um, which is where contactless cards come in. They combat that, they provide another tool um, for issuers to start converting those low ticket transactions. A couple more stats just to throw out there. Uh, right now in the US, 
for transactions between zero and ten dollars, sixty-two percent of them are cash. And for transactions between ten and twenty-five dollars, forty-two percent of them are still cash. So clearly that's where cash lives and that's the largest opportunity to convert it. Next slide, please. So I alluded to the fact that consumers prefer contactless cards. And this is, this is research from the US on consumers that currently hold contactless enabled cards. Um, they prefer paying contactlessly to all other payment form factors, to Magstripe, to Chip, to mobile. And it's not even really close. You know, I think the one I find most interesting is the differentiation between contactless cards and mobile. Um, because essentially they work the same way and the experience is pretty similar. But I think as an industry, we may have underestimated how big of a, a situation gap there was to go from card to mobile. And contactless cards pretty clearly start to bridge that gap. So for uh, consumers who own a contactless card, 40% of them use it wherever they can. Um, and that's without really doing much consumer awareness marketing. That's without uh, a huge presence on the issuing side, and that's without ubiquitous acceptance. So we would only expect that number to go up. Next slide, please. On the cash displacement front, this is a trend that we've seen over and over again in markets that have rolled out contactless. Um, in Australia, between 2013 and 2016, they experienced a 16% decline in cash usage. You know, there's obviously shifts away from cash secularly, but contactless accelerates that shift. Um, additionally, in the UK, cash's share of retail spend dropped from about a third to less than a quarter uh, over the four year period from 2011 to 2015. And Canada saw something similar, about a third fewer tr cash transactions in 2015 than in 2008. Um, it's hard to pin all of that on contactless, but it certainly contributes to it. And we've done a fair amount of research, uh, both internally and externally, that draws a very strong and clear link between contactless issuance and cash displacement. Next slide, please. So we have one more poll. I'll give everyone about 10 or 15 seconds to fill this out. All right, so it seems pretty evenly split between top of wallet preference, conversion of cash, and competitive differentiation. And the truth is all of those things work together. They're not in isolation. So it's encouraging to see that. And with that, I will hand it over to Jamie to talk about implementation. Uh, thanks, DJ, and thanks everyone for uh, hanging on through uh, throughout this webinar and participating. Uh, we have one more section, and then we'll save some time for uh, questions uh, and hopefully have some good ones to answer. So let's go ahead and move forward uh, to the next slide. Uh, there's no way to um, <clears throat> to pretend otherwise, but uh, issuing uh, EMV, uh, dual interface or contactless EMV cards is more complex than uh, contact only EMV. That's why in almost every market, including now, of course, in the U.S., it, it isn't uh, or almost always isn't rolled out as part of the initial adoption uh, and uh, migration to EMV. Usually so it's a two-step factor where you see a migration to contact only and then a consideration for contactless or dual interface EMV cards as part of a second generation. So I'm going to go through some of the considerations for a few slides that you should be thinking about uh, when uh, issuing EMV uh, or contactless EMV cards. Uh, obviously, every payment brand out there has their own specific requirements and recommendations for how a contactless card should be issued. So you uh, number one place you should always start 
is with your the, you know the brand that you work with for issuance for your card portfolio or brands if you uh, issue on multiple brands uh, to make sure that you understand what their recommendations and uh, specifically requirements are uh, because they do uh, they do definitely uh, differ. One of the biggest changes that most issuers will come across relative to their current contact only EMV cards is that most uh, if not all the brands do require uh, supporting um, offline card authentication methods or um, sometimes referred to as CAM. You often will also hear this referred to as offline data authentication or ODA. Uh, and basically what this means is this is the ability of a terminal to be able to uh, validate that a card is genuine uh, strictly in the card to terminal interaction. So normally a transaction has to go online uh, for a car, uh, for the terminal to determine that uh, the card is genuine, so as part of the um, authorization response message, there's information that validates it. Yes, this in fact is you know, a genuine transaction. Uh, the issuer is able to do that in their host environment. Uh, this offline card authentication method or CAM does requ does allow it. Uh, terminal to determine that very quickly, really uh, right when the card is first inserted. So uh, and there's some benefits of this, uh, specifically uh, in the transit use case, it allows someone to be able to insert their, you know, tap their card um, and get a, um, a very quick response that the terminal knows the card is genuine and open the turnstile to let someone through without having to wait for an authorization response from the issuing bank or their processor. And so this allows for a, you know, a much quicker uh, movement of people through turnstiles uh, in transit. It's useful really in any place where you need to turn people, you know, move people along quickly and where perhaps it's a low dollar volume and you can get the authorization response uh, you know, after the fact uh, with relatively low risk. So that's really one of the uh, main industries that's driving the need for to support uh, offline card authentication methods or um, CAMs, offline CAMs in uh, for contactless cards. Now, in order to do this, the card has to have an additional type of keys and cryptography integrated into the personalization process. It's different than the type of keys that were used for contact only EMV. And so again, this does add a little bit of uh, complexity uh, to the uh, personalization process and the implementation process. Now keep in mind that this is not the same thing as saying the card has to support offline authorizations or, or offline transactions. There is no requirement that the cards have to be able to you know, a, a decision a transaction offline. It just is a methodology to allow the terminal to determine that the card is genuine very quickly uh, without having to wait for the offline or the um, online response message. So again, it adds some complexity uh, uh, to the implementation process. The second thing that you should consider really is to ensure, uh, if at all possible, that the cards you issue support this legacy contactless standard that's called uh, MagStripe data, or sometimes referred to as MSD contactless. This was the contactless methodology and technology that was used in that previous generation of contactless cards that uh, Oliver mentioned in his, uh, in his slides a few moments ago. And the reason why it's important to continue to support this is just because there are still uh, many, many uh, POS terminals out there that still only support this older methodology of contactless transactions. What's nice is if you have a card that can support uh, both, you're ensured that's going to work at any contactless accepting terminal. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of time before the older generation contactless terminals are swapped out for newer ones or they're upgraded to support what's called contactless EMV transactions. But for the time being, no one knows exactly how long it's going to take. It could take, uh, you know, we, we just don't know. So to be on the safe side, it's, it's an important consideration to, to think about if, you know, if at all possible to have those cards support those, uh, the older standard. Um, the, depending again on the brand, the payment brand you're working with, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, or uh, Diners Club or Discover, you, you may want uh, to consider multiple personalization profiles. You may have different choices to consider about what, what the card does for offline transactions and other options. So again, that really ties into the first point about each payment brand having their requirements and recommendations. But again, some payment brands uh, steer very strongly to just one particular profile. Others give you many options to consider. So again, be aware of those and what are the uh, trade-offs and benefits of each of those options. 
And then uh, a last point I'll mention on this uh, slide is just something to consider if whether or not you want to include um, RF shielding or radio frequency shielding uh, when you're mailing the cards. The idea behind this, and again, this gets periodically, it gets some publicity in the, in the press, uh, that it is possible uh, to be able to read some data off of the card through the contactless interface while the card is still in the envelope. Now, why someone would you know, that needs to do this and not just you know steal the whole envelope? Uh, it, you know that you can debate that. The, there's a couple of important things to keep in mind here. Um, one is the data that can be taken or read through the envelope is not sufficient to make a fake card or to um, to do fake transactions. It's you know the information that's there uh, is usually for contactless transactions, and obviously if you get that information, you could you can write it down, but you can't use it to make a fake card. Second thing is you can shield the envelope. There's there's ways again the the um, personalization vendors you work with can provide solutions to this. Either you can do an insert, like a buck slip inside the envelope that uh, contains some shielding material on it, or the entire envelope can be shielded to prevent the radio uh, signals from getting, you know, from being penetrated. Uh, there's even the possibility, depending on the, the chip and the payment application, that the contactless interface can be disabled until the card is, uh, you know, used the one time through its contact interface. So that's another option to, to discuss with your vendors. It, and again, it's not, to the best of my knowledge, it's not required by any of the payment brands. It's an option. It's just something to consider and think about as you as you roll out this um, uh, your your contactless programs. Let's go and move on to the next slide, please. Now with this complexity comes uh, requirements for all of the partners you work with, and you need to make sure that uh, there's plenty of um, communication and discussion with each of your partners uh, to make sure that the support is there uh, for contactless transactions. Uh, so I'll go through a few that uh, that we can think of. Uh, obviously the processor that you work with, unless you are uh, doing your own processing, but if you work with any processor, you need to ensure that, that they can support contactless transactions. Uh, including support for the contactless um, MagStripe data standard I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, obviously, if you're issuing those cards that can support that that standard. Um, again, the, it's just a different cryptogram, a different type of data that's passed along with the transaction that uh, comes with those types of transactions. So you need to make sure that the processor can support the uh, support those. Uh, or again, if you ha do your own processing, that your homegrown system can can do it as well. And if you work with any partners or um, uh, you know, any partners that provide stand-in processing, whether it be a payment brand or any other parties, again, make sure that they can support the contactless transactions and have the information necessary to be able to be expecting those transactions uh, and process them effectively. So um, that's one important partner to, to make sure can can support contactless. Obviously your card manufacturer that you work with, whoever wherever you procure your cards, they have to be able to support contactless or dual interface cards. They have to be able to manufacture cards that have a dual interface chip and an antenna embedded in the card. So that's really um, one of the primary differences between the contact-only EMV cards and these contactless cards is that there's an antenna, a very thin antenna embedded into the plastic body as part of the manufacturing process. And then there has to be a way of uh, coupling those two, uh, the chip and the antenna. Uh, there's different technologies to support that. So again, make sure you work with your manufacturer to get that done. Uh, you should plan for a change in your card design. And there's a couple things you could think about. Uh, one is, uh, to include the contactless indicator, which is pictured there on the slide. Uh, and again, depending on the payment brand, there may be specifications about where that must go on the card or what size it must be. So uh, most of the payment brands have card brand guidelines that specify this. One thing I'll just mention is if you have the ability to place that on the front of the card, uh, you might think about doing, uh, doing that as almost a, a promotion of the card's capability. This is something that's new. It really is a very, you know, a very nice benefit and well received by the card holder, but it's important that they know it's there and putting that symbol on the front of the card reminds them every time they pull it out of their wallet 
that oh yeah that's right I can try tapping and you know and save myself a few seconds so again it's um, it's kind of like uh, selling if you will the benefit that you provide to your card holders by putting it on the front one other thing to be aware of is the um, you know the part on the front of the card where you see the chip it's actually called the contact plate it's not the chip itself but it's the the part that you insert into the terminal to um, you know to have a contact DMV transaction that contact plate the size of it might be different than uh, you know slightly larger than what you have for your contact only chip there are different sizes available for both contact only and dual interface uh, EMV cards uh, but, you, but just be aware uh, depending on the chip that you that you select and that your manufacturer has available the size of that contact plate might be a, a bit larger and so it might require or might um, provoke uh, sort of promote redesign of this or a slight redesign of your plastic to accommodate that larger chip size uh, the personalization bureau that you work with again if you don't personalize cards yourself and in, uh, in-house they have to be able to support the contactless profiles and to, they have to be able to generate those additional keys necessary for the offline card authentication method or offline cam and lastly, and, and very importantly, don't overlook your instant issuance vendor if you do any in-branch instant issuance. Again, you might require upgrades to your equipment and um, or most likely your software that's used to personalize your EMV cards. Uh, fortunately, most of the equipment that I've encountered for instant issuance can support dual interface uh, cards or contactless cards because they're in most cases, they're personalized to the exact same contact interface for both the contact and contactless transactions. But again, just make sure you work with your vendor, uh, and they li likely all, um, also may need to generate and support the keys needed for those offline um, data authentication or offline card authentication method. So just be aware of that, and that might require even an upgrade to uh, an HSM if you have that as part of your instant issuance solution. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, you should give some thought to um, how you're going to do this in terms of timing and market segmentation. Uh, the reality is that with with the contact EMV cards, we also were all up against a certain type of, of it wasn't really a deadline, but there was a liability shift that had a, a specific date, uh, to, to, you know, differed by the you know payment brands and different things like that. But ultimately, there was a liability shift with a with a line drawn in the sand that a lot of people wanted to make sure they were ready for. We don't have anything like that, like a ticking clock here that uh, forces everyone to shoot, to shoot for a certain date. So you have flexibility in terms of how you roll out your contactless cards and when you time it. So again, this, which, is, which is good, it gives you some flexibility. What uh, many will do is you can uh, schedule things so that the transition to contactless coincides with the natural reissuance of your so the second let's just say the second generation of issuance of your EMV card so the first time someone got an EMV card from you uh, it would be a contact only and then three four or five years later whatever your reissuance cycle might be then you replace that with a contactless or dual interface EMV card that's a very common strategy but some of you may have other off-cycle events that uh, would encourage you or, or be a good opportunity to do a much more accelerated reassurance with contactless, such as if you're doing, brand, you know, uh, switching brands on your card. If there's a, um, you know, if you're acquiring another uh, bank or being acquired or credit union, if there's mergers and acquisitions, things like that going on, significant branding changes within your within your institution, not just a change of the brand on the front of the car, but changes within your institution. Any of those could be an off-cycle event that would require, you know, that might be leverageable to get uh, contactless cards out there. So again, your particular cir uh, circumstances could drive the timing of your issuance. Uh, and then again, you could think that the, you know, the rollout strategy or timing could differ uh, for your credit portfolio versus your debit portfolio. One of the statistics we saw earlier on in the presentation was that there's a higher rollout penetration for credit cards versus debit. Uh, so you do see some of that already present uh, to this, at, at this point. And again, you don't have to, but you could think about how, uh, how to segment your portfolio for rollout or for issuance of contactless cards. So one of the most compelling use cases for contactless is on public transit. So if you have a certain percentage of cardholders that are in 
uh, New York or Boston or Chicago or markets with with you know significant usage of the of public transportation, you might prioritize those markets or just you know just, just issue there to start to see how it goes. Uh, another way you could segment is by a, a level of card usage or engagement. So you know only issue to your active cardholders or you know issue to inactive cardholders and see if that moves the needle and gets them to start using the card more. Uh, issue to people who travel outside the U.S., you know, people who are traveling frequently to Canada or Europe. Um, again, since contactless acceptance is so advanced in those markets and really in many, in many ways expected, uh, many people who travel to the U.S. find that when you know, they go into a coffee shop, uh, that the person behind the counter first, you know, try, you know, by default tries to tap their card because all the cards there that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis are contactless. So again, you might find real strong usage and uh, use cases for uh, getting those cardholders contactless cards. You might use it as a differentiator for your high net worth portfolio. Um, but again, the, the other side of segmentation like this is to consider the, the cost of it um, obviously, it's 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 more expensive to issue a contactless cards versus contact only, but there's also costs associated with maintaining multiple card inventories. Some contact only for some of your portfolio, and contactless for other parts of your portfolio. So again, consider uh, the trade-off. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, please make sure you uh, save some time and put some effort into developing education uh, materials both for card holders and for your employees um, just as you revised your card carriers when you first went to, to EMV to, to explain how, how to use an EMV chip card and what were the benefits of the EMV chip card you're going to want to do something similar here once you're going through the uh, time and effort of doing contactless cards so again give the information about the benefits of the, the speed of the transaction where they can use the transaction uh, even the, it sounds silly, but explaining how to complete a contactless transaction. Many people just kind of wave it and uh, very quickly buy the, the contactless reader and expect it to work instantly as opposed to you know tapping and holding for a half a second and hearing that beep or the seeing that light. So again, promote the benefits, promote the um, you know the information about how to use it uh, emphasize that these contactless cards are secure and the safety of it because again you know you will see some people out there explaining you know trying to scare everyone about the threats of someone reading these cards uh, and, and stealing the data and it's just not the case but there are people who are trying to make a quick buck off of selling you know shields and special wallets and this and that by scaring everyone so be prepared for that like and communicate effectively likewise for your employees uh, train them about these cards as well to make sure they can answer questions if someone calls in and asks about the safety of the cards they may need to be able to identify contactless transactions for processing of i don't know of disputes or chargebacks depending on the payment brand rules and regulations so uh, just be aware of employee um, education as well and with that we have one final poll question we can advance to the next slide please Okay, so the question is, what challenges, if any, do you see uh, with issuing contactless or dual interface cards? And so please take a few seconds just to click on your uh, answer. And you can, oh, and this one you can select all that apply. Although if you select none, I'd say that probably should be the only one you select, but you could certainly select um, all four of the other options. Let's give it another second or two. Okay, let's see the answers people gave. Okay, so yeah, the top answer was uh, the acceptance infrastructure, but very close behind it is the business case and understanding and being able to make a, a compelling business case to justify the investment needed for contactless. Uh, so that's very important. And certainly, hopefully, some of the information that, uh, that we provided, uh, TJ provided about the increase in usage and the displacement of cash and the... Um, the potential that provides for incremental revenue uh, could help uh, solve that problem. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and move forward uh, to the, I believe we have uh, questions and answers coming up uh, next. Kathy? Great, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, presenters, and thanks to everyone who participated in the poll. We have a couple of minutes for a few questions, and we had a number of really good ones come in. So um, first, um, there were a, quite, uh, several questions that came in, Jose, on the 
uh, payment network requirements and mandates um, in terms of whether that applies outside the U.S., inside the U.S.? Can you help to um, qualify that? Uh, yeah, and, and most of the, the requirements and mandates are for outside of the U.S. today, so it's Latin America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia. Um, I, I, and there are different timelines depending on the specific uh, payment network, right? So, so I, I guess first, the clarification when we're talking about guidelines and mandates in that section was just international outside of the U.S. Now, as to the specific date, I believe we, there are additional resources. A lot of the networks have made it public, uh, have publicly announced, and I would invite uh, uh, the different issuers, merchants, to, to contact their network payment network uh, representative to to get a bit, uh, to get more details. Thanks, Jose. That clarifies. Um, there's a question, TJ, on some of the stats that you presented on. Um, how contactless adoption um, segments by debit versus credit card usage. Do you have any further information on that? Yeah, definitely. So um, we think contactless, the rollout, will mirror EMV, where credit will lead, um, just because it's easier operationally. You can segment it a little better, uh, and you can target consumers who you think will use it a little bit better with debit following. That said, because contactless is uh, most pertinent for these everyday spend segments, which are primarily debit today, we think the business case for debit um, is just as strong, if not stronger, than for credit. And in fact, there are a handful of issuers um, that have converted their entire debit portfolios to contactless already, uh, and they are seeing double-digit usage of contactless, meaning that more than 10% of their face-to-face -face transactions are contactless today. Great, thanks, TJ. Um, we had a number of questions come in on merchant acceptance, and that was one of the top uh, challenges that were cited. And so the questions revolve around, uh, what does a merchant need to do to turn on contactless if they're enabled but not capable? Um, and what um, what's the certification process? Can someone take that question? Maybe, um, TJ, you could start. Sure. Uh, so I may not be the best person to speak to that. Um, I've primarily been focused on the issuer side of things, but my understanding is that there is a software update that can be pushed out through acquire or acquire processor or middleware providers um, and the testing and certification on that side of things uh, can take, as opposed to EMV where it was six to 12 months, it's closer to one to two months. Um, Oliver or anyone else, if you have more details, please jump in. Yeah, it's, it's Oliver. I can try to give a high level overview. So yeah, there's typically a software component that needs upgrading. So whether that's a push or you know, it depends if it's a large merchant, they'll do it in-house. Um, if, if they're dealing with some you know ISO or something like that, they'll provide it. So once that software is in place, then it's a matter of um, going to one of the test tool pro providers and there's a number out there and a little bit different from EMV contact each brand has their own specific contactless test cases. But the good news is that the um, test tool providers have, you know, the entire test suite for Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, et cetera, et cetera. So once you get the test tool, whether it's, you know, you acquire that in-house or through your payment processing provider, you run through the suite of them, make sure everything's working, and then you go to the payment brand for, you know, the final seal of approval. So it's not particularly onerous. Um, certainly easier than it was in days gone by. Thanks, Oliver. And I'll, I'll do one more question. I apologize for running late today, but we still do have quite a few people on the call. And this question came in in terms of um, do you really need to issue contactless cards? Why not promote and issue the various pays to do contactless? Jamie, yeah, this is yeah, this one? is Jamie. Sure, I'll add to and and Oliver touched upon this a bit uh, at the beginning, but it, it's important to note um, that the the big benefit or the big challenge with um, using 
the handset, the mobile hand, you know, one of the pays on your on your phone, is that ultimately, if it, if you're in a merchant where it, it's not working or that's not accepting, uh, even if you try used it there before, once you once you reach that cross, so you then have to go, you know, back to your wallet uh, or purse to get out a card and start over. Whereas once you have the piece of plastic in your hand, it's very it's a very quick motion. If you tap and you don't get the beep to insert the chip. If you insert the chip and for some reason it doesn't work, to swipe. I mean, without the sort of the awkwardness of having to go back. And so people just are more comfortable when you when you know with absolute confidence that one of those three interfaces is going to work on that piece of plastic. Uh, every pretty much everywhere that accepts cards anywhere in the world, uh, that you, you know you just feel much more confident pulling that out of your wallet and and using that as your payment methodology. Yeah, the thought was initially maybe you know we'll use the the mobile device for the contactless inter transactions and use the, phys the physical plastic for everything else. It just, we haven't seen the adoption of the pays, uh, and use, in particular in the usage, even at merchants that accepted and where it's been used successfully before. Uh, so that's why I think it's, it does make sense to really consider, uh, consider the card uh, you know, as an option for contactless interface. Yeah, and it's all over. And I, th I think another sort of interesting point, and uh, again, I, so I live up in Canada. It's a very mature contactless market, and we have all of the pays as well. Um, and, and I personally thought that they were going to take off as soon as they became avail available. But in the fullness of time, I mean, that just hasn't happened the way people expected it to. And the contactless transactions by a vast majority are still taking place with people's cards. So I think a portion of that has to do with exactly what Jamie just said. Another portion of it is that, frankly, you know, we on this call all live and breathe payments all of our lives. For those people that are, you know, in our families and our neighborhoods and things like that, they don't. They don't think about, hey, you know, I just got this new phone and I've got an option to credential a card to it and, you know, I can go off and try using my mobile phone where I use my card. They, for four decades or whatever, have used nothing but a piece of plastic that's worked really, really well for them all the time. So that conditioning that they've had for four decades to all of a sudden switch to another form factor when, frankly, that card works perfectly well for them. Um, isn't something that happens overnight. So the vast majority of transactions, even in contactless mature markets, are being done still on card versus other form factors. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I'm sorry, but that's all the time we have today for questions. Um, and I'm, I do apologize for running over. I did, do want to remind you that we have additional resources on contactless payments on the Alliance website. Um, it, next slide, please, in our Knowledge Center. So if you look at both the Alliance website and the U.S. Payments Forum website, you'll find um, both um, white papers, infographics, as well as a security Q&A for those of you who would like to learn more about security. Next slide, please. So I'd like to thank Oliver, Jose, TJ, and Jamie for their presentations and support of this web webinar, and to all of you for attending. Um, I did put the contact information for the presenters today. If you have further questions, you can send those to me or to send them to the other presenters. Also, um, when the um, webinar ends, you'll see a short four-question survey. If you could answer um, the questions and let us know what you got out of the webinar, that would be great. It would help us plan our future webinars. We, will, we, ha was re we were recording this webinar, and we will be posting a link and in an email to you 